Hello, my name is John DeBoer. I'm a senior policy advisor for the Center for Policy Research here at United Nations University, and I'd like to welcome you to today's conversation series. Today we're speaking with Professor Kiji Fujiwara, who is from the University of Tokyo, a professor of international politics. He's also the author of numerous books, including a prize award winning book in 2005, Realist Peace, which won the Ishibashi Tanzan Journalism Award. Um, he is also a, a very active commentator on Japanese television, uh, international television, and we're very pleased to have him with us. Welcome, Professor Fujiwara. Hello. So, you've commented very often on uh, Japanese television internationally, also written about Japanese foreign policy. We're in a very interesting time, I believe. Yes. But I'd like to ask you, first off, what's interesting and, and unique about Japan's foreign policy today? Japan uh, lost a destructive war, the Second World War. And after that, um, the Japanese, the emphasis, the priority of Japanese foreign policy was not military power, mm -hmm. but economic development. Uh, this is not a moralistic argument. Uh, the, the whole economy was in shattered. Mm -hmm. So um, the only thing the Japanese could do was to focus on the economy and spend less mm -hmm. on military expenditure. Uh, the kind of solution was that um, Japan would rely on American forces mm -hmm. for homeland defense and uh, keep away from spending too much on military matters. Mm -hmm. Now, this was the basis that led to what we call economic diplomacy. Um, starting from 1970s, essentially following the reparation to Southeast Asian nations, the Japanese used overseas development dates mm -hmm as a tool to cultivate um, overseas markets. It was not only good for Japanese cooperation, mm. it was also on developing infrastructure and in many regions. In many ways, you can see similarity uh, with the Chinese mm. um, credit policy right now that we see. Now, in this way, uh, there was a great focus on the economy, which is slightly changing mm. at this moment as there's more attention to the security issues, mm -hmm. such as the threat of North Korea mm -hmm. and the instability in the relationship between China mm -hmm. and her neighbors. There's more interest in geopolitics mm -hmm. rather than economic affairs. Mm -hmm. So therefore, what used to be an economy first policy is shifting to a more conventional mm -hmm. um, geopolitical strategy. And we must also remember that the public opinion in Japan was extremely and strongly against any military activities. Mm. And this was, of course, um, partly due to the Article 9 of the Constitution, but it's not only that. And the interesting p thing is that this pacifism also worked as a certain kind of isolationism. Mm. It's a combination of noble ideas. And also an extremely isolationist um, push to keep Japan away mm. from international affairs. And right now we are observing a rather classical uh, confrontation between the two, the geopolitical focus mm. and also the pacifist isolationist focus, which took place, I believe, in year 2015. So this dynamic combination of domestic politics mm. and foreign policy making is something that makes Japan, well, interesting. Hmm. Excellent answer, which gets me to, to hmm. think about uh, yen diplomacy. Yes. You know, traditionally, um, and when many international scholars, for example, think about Japan, mm -hmm. they think about yen diplomacy, the reality, as, as we all know, is that uh, the yen is not as strong as it used to be. Um, the Japanese economy mm -hmm. is not as strong as it used to be. Does yen diplomacy have a future? Is there something else now that Japan needs to think about? That's an extremely interesting question because uh, we're observing right now mm -hmm. a significant, significant shift. Um, economic diplomacy, what you have called yen diplomacy, yeah. was at its prime uh, in the 1970s and mm -hmm. 1980s. And afterwards, um, this policy changed. Uh, the focus was no longer Southeast Asia or China, but more in conflict within regions. Mm -hmm 
such as Middle East, North Africa, uh, or uh, an African nation such as Congo. Mm. Um, the idea was humanitarian assistance yeah. and human security. Now, Japanese ODA aids to Southeast Asia um, work not only for the benefit of Japanese corporations, but also uh, cultivated a market mm. for um, regional division of labor. Yeah. And it worked very well. Mm -hmm. The Japanese economy was extremely competitive. This human security focus did not really have an economic counterpart. Mm. This was more um, a straightforward aid policy. Now we are observing a new trend where there is a redefinition of Japanese aid policy um, that aids the growth of Japanese economy. Mm. And I think it's not too much to say that the reason for this is a competition with China. Mm. Now, China is an extremely um, strong economy that is growing. It's, um, the growth is decreasing, but nonetheless, it's a growing economy. And Japan is not really in that position. Mm. And the economy has stabilized, but we can't expect a growth rate of, say, 5, 6, 7 percent. Mm. It's not, it, quite out of the question. The competitive fish uh, that Japan may have comes in two forms. One is that Japanese products has a more um, dependable quality. Uh, it's extremely, um, well, uh, uh, the high price is right. makes it so uh, less competitive in the market, mm -hmm. but the products are dependable. Now, if the Japanese government somehow supports this kind of policy, mm. and uh, with Japanese um, um, public funds, make the products relatively cheaper. Mm. Uh, well, that would be very nice. Right. Um, this is uh, done in a period when the overinvestment that mm. came from China is decreasing. Mm. So in many ways, we see a shift from China to Japan, mm. but I doubt if the Japanese um, shift toward, reshift toward yen diplomacy right. is sufficient to uh, make up for the relative retreat yeah. um, in Chinese public investment. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Japan's place in Asia, mm -hmm. it's been in the, in the minds of Japanese for centuries, yes. obviously, but Asia has changed dramatically mm -hmm. over the past, you know, 20, 30 years, continues to change. Yes. And, uh, you know, obviously you've mentioned China, its mm -hmm. growth. Uh, we also must say that India mm -hmm. has grown dramatically not just economically, mm -hmm. but also in terms of geopolitical stature yes. over the past years. How does a Japan view its place in Asia, mm -hmm. say, in, in the future? Another, another excellent question um, where we see a significant change again. Japan was the self-chosen capital mm -hmm. of Asia. And with the uh, decline of Chinese empire, the Xin Empire, uh, Tokyo became a capital mm -hmm. of the Middle Kingdom, so to say. So whenever the Japanese talked about Asianism, Asia Shugi, mm -hmm. uh, cooperation with yeah. Asian cultures, uh, Tokyo was always central mm. in her role. Um, that is no longer the case. We see more competition. Um, both China and India's rise means that Japan can not, no longer occupy the only central mm. position in the globe. Um, from this, we see two things. Uh, one is that Japan is trying to reassert its position by competing mm -hmm. with the neighbors. Um, and to that effect, uh, strengthening ties with India mm -hmm. um, has a very clear geopolitical implication, and that is to, um, to face China mm -hmm. uh, by, this, uh, by this partnership. It's not an alliance, but um, the use of India is to somehow um, enlarge uh, the influence toward China. The other one is to strengthen alliance with Western powers. Mm. Now, Japan always was um, you know, moving from the Western identity to the Eastern identity. Sometimes the Japanese would say that Japan is Asian and not Western. Yeah. And then in other occasions, the Japanese would say that Japan is the only Westernized nation <laughs> in the region. Uh, right now, um, there is more focus on human rights, mm. democracy, common values with the West. Right. And that, of course, is uh, singling out uh, China as, uh, as the old man out. Mm. Um, how this can continue is an open question. Right. I really much doubt it. 
because the advocates for such um, human rights orientation are at the same time focusing on more nationalistic policy mm. at home. So they're talking about human rights and democracy toward China, mm. but at the same time at home they're talking about reviving traditionalist values. It's a very strange combination, although that is a combination that is not unique in Japan. No. For uh, we see a revival of a um, traditionalist definition of Chinese power mm. in the Chinese leadership, leadership right now. It's rather strange to find a communist leadership talking about the Ming Dynasty. Mm. But this uh, revival of traditionalism goes hand in hand mm. with an extremely uh, Western focus on the economy. So Asia is getting more bizarre, mm. but that makes it more interesting for us to study. Which brings me to the U.S.-Japan alliance. As you know, the U.S.-Japan alliance has been a cornerstone of Japanese security policy over the past 50, 60, 70 years. But some are saying that the next 15 years are going to be critical mm. to the Japan, U.S.-Japan alliance. What is your view of the future of the U.S.-Japan alliance, particularly as China rises? Well, first of all, we have to remember that the Americans haven't made up their mind about China. <laughs> On, on the one hand, there is more attention to engagement mm. and bringing China to the Western world. And on the other hand, there's geopolitical tension, uh, taking China as the next um, major military power that the Americans may have to confront. Mm. Um, in Japan, uh, we have both visions as well. Geopolitically, uh, China is a growing power, and I guess the, um, the anxiety over China's geopolitical rights is more acute mm -hmm. in Japan than uh, in the United States, uh, with obvious reasons. There, there's a very significant shift in the power balance there. So that pushes Japan t in the direction of the United States. Mm. But we have to remember that neither the Japanese or the Americans are interested in major wars yeah. with China. Now, Western alliance is very useful in deterring major wars. What happens when um, the potential adversary is not interested in major wars, mm -hmm. but is trying to skim off mm -hmm. certain gains in the geopolitical game? Mm -hmm. You're not going to start a war over um, South China Sea or all those rocks. That also means that if you're not going to do anything, and then uh, the power that is uh, restrained but adamant in pushing their agenda mm -hmm. uh, would gain an upper hand. Mm -hmm. And that's the situation both the, Chinese, uh, both the Americans and the Japanese are worried about. Mm -hmm. But the reaction is quite different because uh, for the Americans, this is essentially about the security of the Allies mm -hmm. at Homeland. Right. Um, they are quite sure that the PRC is not interested in a major war mm. with, uh, with the United States. Uh, for Japan, this is about um, her own territories. Mm. So the interest is much more acute. Right. Now, right now, as, uh, as most Japanese would take American power to be declining, maintaining a stable alliance means that the Japanese can enhance her power mm. within the alliance. And in fact, the Americans would like it. Mm. So um, a greater Japanese role goes hand in hand with relative less burden mm. from, uh, for the United States. Mm. Whether this can be sustained in 10, 20 years is another question. Right. Because uh, this means that the United States will have to face less role in the region mm. and a larger role played by, the, by, ja by Japan. Uh, my impression is that right now Pentagon right. is more welcoming Mm. Japanese participation, while um, the State Department or the Obama presidency is more cautious, mm. as um, it could be a more vocal Japan that might bring the United States into a conflict that they dislike. And then there's one other dimension that both the Americans and the Japanese share, and that is the crush in the Chinese market, mm -hmm. which will be a hazard for everybody. Mm. And because of this, uh, an approach to China cannot only be dictated by geopolitical terms. Uh, and there is a common economic interest, um, whether you like the Communist Party or not. Mm -hmm. uh, we are interdependent. 
and then if there's a, there's a burst in the Chinese market, we're going to suffer. And on this, again, I believe that the Japanese are far more fragile mm. to the fluctuations in the Chinese market than the United States. Mm. All of this means that in a couple of years, you, we would see a tightening of the U.S.-Japan alliance. But there is uh, a difference of, of objective, not based on um, ideas or norms, mm. but essentially based on distance. Japan is much closer right. to China. Mm -hmm. And also Japan is relatively weaker mm. than China compared to the United States. Mm. And those um, factors will um, be a challenge wow. in maintaining good relationship with the US. Absolutely. Well, we could go on, I, yeah. I'm sure, for hours. But uh, thank you. That was a fascinating expose of what we will speak to tonight as okay. well. I'd like to thank the audience for joining us. Thank you.